Eric Prince is a businessman, philanthropist, former U.S. Navy SEAL, and he's best known for founding the government service and security company Blackwater USA. He served as its CEO until 2009 and later as its chairman until Blackwater Worldwide was sold in 2010. He now runs a private equity firm while raising his seven, seven children. Good heavens. I didn't know he had seven children. You see, I should read my notes before we start the show. Uh, like me, he's a Catholic. And, and in between my wife and I, we have 12 now. So wow. we have, a, you see, we have this, a Brady Bunch dozen. Perhaps this explains the question I'm going to ask you at the end of the interview, which you've seen before, which you said gave you a belly laugh. You see, now I'm starting to, now I'm starting to get it. Uh, like, like me, that was, that was Eric Prince, by the way, ladies and gents. Like me, he's a Catholic, probably a better one than I am. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you, Mr. Prince, to the Milo Show. Uh, thank you for your service, and thanks for joining me this evening. Thanks for having me. So I've got two things that I want to talk to you about, and then we'll wander off into fun areas in the second half of the show. The first thing is, after Orlando happened, I went down there, I gave a speech about radical Islam and the threats that it represents to the Western way of life, to modern, democratic, Western, liberal capitalism. Of course, the left doesn't listen to these things. But even among conservatives, I felt this sort of a sense of, of complete panic and confusion and befuddlement. And you're the only person really that I think I've heard in the last six months to clarify very clearly, crisply and completely a sort of simple plan, like how we do it, how we beat ISIS, how we defeat radical Islam in the Middle East. Now, you've spoken a little bit about this on a Breitbart radio show before with our executive chairman, Steve Bannon. But for my audience, could you perhaps sketch out this three point plan? Sure. ISIS Dash claims legitimacy because they have a caliphate. They believe creating an earthly kingdom that they dominate and expand to control the rest of the civilized world. So, so to destroy that first, you have to take away that caliphate from them. That means no land that they govern, nothing that they control. And, and to do that, you need to crush their conventional combat capability. So whether you do that with a massive U.S. conventional force, whether you do that with NATO, not going to happen. <laughs> not going to happen with a U.S. big – it's not going to happen with a big U.S. conventional force, okay? I, n neither presidential candidate, hopefully it's Trump, neither one's going to have the real political will to do that, nor do they need to. NATO certainly not going to do it. The neighbors, okay, the Arab neighbors in those countries really lack the wherewithal to do that. And so I would recommend a a hybrid approach, almost like what the CIA did to the Taliban and al-Qaeda in Afghanistan after 9-11, uh, a few agency operatives, some hired forces, some local forces with a blend of combat support, air support from the U.S., and they very quickly crush the Taliban. The same thing could be done to any conventional pockets against ISIS. Second, the money. Taking away their conventional or their land that they hold, this caliphate of Western Iraq and Syria, takes away a lot of their money, not making money on oil artifacts, uh, hostage taking and extortion that they do now, but they would still get funding from some radical Islamists, billionaire jihadists, if you will. And I recommend a Phoenix program to do that. Phoenix this is program the Vietnam was a, thing, right? It was a controversial, but very effective root canal against the Viet Cong, the communist insurgency in Vietnam, and it ended them as a force. And so doing that with a target kill capture program, to stop the money. And, and three, just, just spell out what that is. Sorry, before you go into your third one, just spell out what that would mean exactly. Because I understand the principle, but what would you do? Who would be taken out in that plan? Well, uh, I, I, I don't have a list for you now, but... Um, <laughs> no, no, uh, but of know, course. Santa's got a list and he's, he's checking it twice who's been naughty and who's been nice. <laughs> it, it's, it's obvious the guys that keep funding radical causes that keep sending weapons to the hardcore... Al Nusra, Al Qaeda, and Daesh forces uh, in the Middle East, it's got to stop. And if some of those wealthy donors went missing, the rest of them would get a message. But we've never, as a civilized society, has never taken a hard line against that. And so that would be killer capture for them. Mm -hmm. And third is beating them back in the cyber world. And of course, uh, this is how they recruit the lone wolf gunmen to recruit, you know mentally ill and truly uh, crazy people that think they can atone for their problems in life by doing some, some great act of, of atrocity. So to do that, you take down their servers, you target where their, their messaging is coming from, and you refute it every step of the way. I am not an IT expert. I actually have that plan coming together uh, in the next few weeks, meeting with, with all my friends from the business that are. 
put it this way, the plan will be uh, will be fully baked by the time uh, the next administration comes on board. Because I don't think this administration has proven any will or real stomach to end this. And I, as a citizen of Western civilization, am sick and tired of waking up, it seems, every other day and hearing about someone else that's been slaughtered pointlessly by some evil jihadist. Like this poor woman, I think a tourist in London gets murdered by a Somali because this was his day to, to wake up in jihadi. Yes. And enough of that. Well, it seems to be happening with increasing frequency in Europe, and there's not very much reason to suppose that things like Orlando won't keep happening and won't start happening more often in America, too. America doesn't seem to have learned its lesson from Sure. Uh, well, uh, just this week, there was a Washington, D.C. Metro cop who was arrested after uh, long surveillance and charged with trying to provide material support to the Islamic State. So even wow. an American law enforcement officer was turned. You mentioned a moment ago that you hoped it would be Trump. Talk to us a little bit about your opinion of the Republican candidate. I mean, I'm guessing that you are broadly speaking a fan, and I'm guessing that you think Hillary would be a disaster, but I don't want to put words in your mouth. Give us your opinion on, on Donald Trump. I like the fact that Donald Trump has been in the private sector. I like that he's had to make a payroll. I like that he's had to do projects. I even like that some of his projects have gone bankrupt. Because people that do things and build things and try things sometimes fail at doing it. Mm -hmm. And that, that's the strength of the American capitalist system. He sat across the table and fired people that didn't perform in his business. And I'm not talking about the TV show. I'm talking about when hundreds of millions of dollars are on the line. And well, we the TV show have was not had a lead. <laughs> uh, sure. But we, we haven't had a politician that's run a big private organization that they built themselves – and because we basically have a U.S. government that is really broken and it needs a, a massive shaking, it is the establishment rigged cozy system inside the Beltway is not America. I live in Loudoun County and in the counties surrounding Washington, D.C. have the highest per capita income in the country, not because they create wealth. It's because they suck wealth from the rest of the country. And that system needs to be shaken up. And one of the reasons that establishment politicians from both sides of the aisle hate Trump so much is because they know he would shake up that system. So for whether you're a, a Bernie supporter and you're upset by the cost of college, that's because government subsidizes so much that the schools drive it up and they limit the supply of universities that can get accredited. There are so many simple reforms that have to be done to keep America moving forward, really to make it great again. I, we, we've kind of turned our back on the fact that hard work, sacrifice, risk-taking, innovation is what made America great. Washington did not make America great. I think that's a message that's going to resonate with huge numbers of voters, not just on the political right, by the way. So let's talk a little bit about what's going wrong with the military in America. I just want to start by asking you, you spoke on Breitbart Radio recently about General John Allen, and you called him, uh, you said he was indicative of the perfect Beltway General paradigm. What is a Beltway General? And, um, and how does the Pentagon regain some semblance of good working order when so many of these generals seem to be uh, slotting into what you call the Beltway general paradigm? Well, I'll put it in terms of even of a business or, or, or of overhead. In World War II, the United States had about 14 million men and women, mostly men, under arms. Okay, And you had – we have the same amount of flag officers now that we did then. And this is an era where we have – one and a half to two million men and women under arms with the same amount of generals. So you have a very, very bloated overhead structure and everything becomes a bureaucracy. Everything becomes a political decision. And we have very few warrior leaders anymore. That's what I'm talking about. A political general. It's just the go along to get along and no one makes any waves. And the real warriors kind of get weeded out and get sick of the process. And they retire probably as a, as an O5, a Lieutenant Colonel or as a Colonel, and they never bother to stick around to try to get their general officer admiral ticket because it's just too political for them. And, you know, when you look at the generals that won World War II in America, General Patton, he was a junior officer running the, the, the tank school, as was Eisenhower. We had all the generals that were in charge when World War II started were quickly retired or fired, and the warriors were brought in. We've never gone through that transformation in America and we have a very bloated head, uh, headshed. There's 12 generals right now in Iraq leading only 5,000 people. That is an insane 
number. There should at most be one there, probably not even any. That's interesting because I suppose with all these people, they've got to find something to do all day. And do you think that's part of the reason why the military seems to be, and this is always a surprise to people until they read you know, columns about women in the military or transgender people in the military or whatever, the military seems like it's not immune from the spread of political correctness. And we see symptoms of this every day, this sort of creeping idea that you know we have to start gerrymandering standards to make sure that you know every minority group and every sort of you know both genders can serve even if they're not really physically capable what does that do for morale and and soldier you know sort of soldiers with boots on the ground and is it this sort of um a top heavy structure of the military that's responsible for that just people finding things to complain about is that what's going on it's a, a top heaviness which causes uh you're right it causes people to look for things to do and look for ways to to make themselves appear relevant. Um, Even if they're it, just a nuisance. <laughs> well, they, they can be, and they, they can just be dumb things. I, I, when you have that many people standing around looking for something to do, it's just like if you build a big office building for a corporation, they tend to always find a way to fill it with overhead, even <laughs> if they don't really need it. I yeah, literally, when I built Blackwater and we had a headquarters building, it was way bigger than we needed. And we literally roped off parts of the building that people could not go in and not put desks in to literally physically constrain the growth of overhead. That doesn't happen in the Pentagon. And so and, and when you think about it, we've spent $9 trillion as a country since 9-11. $9 trillion in defense. It's okay. incredible. And I mean, we see this I, in the UK too. You've got sort of 70,000 people in the British military who work in procurement. You know, the, the, the vast right. numbers of people. I mean, I'm not sure even the US has that many working in, you know, uh, people who manage people, who manage people, who manage people, who decide where to buy staplers from. You know? the, out, the outgoing sec def, Bill Gates, <laughs> uh, sorry, uh, Bob Gates, he did a study and found that there was 30 layers between him and an action officer that can make a decision in the field. Right. 30, three, zero. It's an That's incredible insane, especially, bureaucracy, especially isn't it? Especially in a time of uh, video conferencing, all kinds of secure communications you can do, or instantaneous communications, versus World War II when it was telegraph and HF radios. So, yes, when you throw a lot of money, hundreds of billions of dollars at an organization, if you never put it on a diet... It gets bloated. Look, I run triathlons from time to time. I'm not the lightest guy. I qualify in the Clydesdale division. I know the triathlon would go way better for me if I weighed 40 pounds less. Same for the Pentagon. You could actually get more defense, more capability if you spent less and forced some fiscal discipline on the organization. Would you also, and I have to ask you directly about this because it's such a big topic at the moment, would you also want to resist some of the interference, some of the pandering and some of the um, sort of gerrymandering that's happening in combat units to get women and, and, and even transgender people involved in the front lines? What's your broad assessment of the sort of women in combat debate? Because you hear a lot of vets say, look, we tried this, it doesn't work. It destroys morale. Women aren't strong enough. They end up having to be protected. The men stop paying attention to what they're doing. You know, the, you know there's so many negative outcomes here. And it's, it's being foisted on us by uh, generals who've never seen combat or haven't done for 30 years. And standards well, are either being overlooked or lowered to get people in the field to effectively put the whole unit at risk. What's your view on that? And, and people will say, if I just give my opinion, they say, well, you're a guy and you're a misogynist or whatever. And then I'd say, okay, look at the science. And the Marine Corps actually did a very thorough job of collecting the science. They put sensors on a whole unit of all females, all males, and a mixed unit. Mm -hmm. And they put them on a 90-day exercise out in, uh, I think, in California, a simulated combat field exercise. Right. It's a long time. I mean, 90 days is they, enough well, to get some data, sure. right? You bet. And uh, so they measured heart rate, movement, how much they carried, an artillery shell, a backpack, climbing up a hill, whatever. And they found significant unit underperformance compared to the all-male unit if we have a marine corps that is there to wage war and win and not worry about everyone feeling good about the outcome because they might have been excluded because they just weren't strong enough as a society we have to really debate that do we want an effective military or do we want a politically happy correct one from my point of view, it's, there's also a sort of moral and social question here. I mean, it, it just, it strikes me 
you may have a different view on this, but it just strikes me as intrinsically horrifying. What kind of society we have turned ourselves into where we expect our women to, you know, to come front on the front, front, on the front lines. We're sending a message that we think that, that women, that we ought to hold on a pedestal and provide for and protect and, and worship and love. Um, we're, we're throwing them into combat. I mean, correct. Th- is chivalry, is chivalry <laughs> that dead? Really? I mean, I don't know whether it's just me. I'm glad you think so too, but uh, so, so many people said, well, this in the age of rigidly enforced gender equality, when people get upset about door holding all sorts of ridiculous things like that the the idea that we would send a message that we're perfectly happy hurling women onto the front line strikes me as as slightly appalling when you look at the thousands of wounded vets that have come back from iraq afghanistan um the vast majority of those are males would american society be ready for half of them to be females I don't think so. No, and of course, women suffer more. And and this this very false idea that wars are sterile, that it's a predator drone watching through a TV screen or watching the the video clips on your evening news, it's not like that. Okay? And a full-on conventional war is an enormous amount of killing and suffering and danger. And again, the sad thing is the lame politicians that make those decisions – it's not their daughters that they're sending anyway. And that's the real hypocrisy of it all. And if you care about women, as anybody with a shred of decency and chivalry and, and integrity ought to, of course, the data, as, as you correctly say, look at the data. The data shows that women simply don't cope as well with the aftermath of war. You know, the trauma, the, the, um, uh, well, the, the, the PTSD the, the, hits them harder. Is that right? Sure. But I'm talking about the conduct of war. Of course. I mean, as course. a nation, the most important thing you have to worry about is well, you how do win we or not, not lose that war? <laughs> we must win. Okay. And making that a secondary consideration to political correctness is societal suicide. After the break, uh, we will uh, return with Eric Prince to talk about Donald Trump, of course, a little bit about Blackwater, and one last mischievous question that i have been been, it's been demanded by my researchers that i ask you Uh, we'll be back after these messages our friends at true car have been selling so many cars thanks to the milo show that i think they may be close to opening true jet finally allowing me to purchase a sponsor's product but until then my beloved audience can continue to utilize true car you may not know that using true car can also help you buy a used car in fact there are over five hundred thousand pre-owned vehicles available from true car certified dealers nationwide whether you're looking to buy new or used you can get upfront pricing information that empowers consumers discounts off the list price for used cars and a better buying experience through our true car certified dealer network you'll see what other people paid for the car you want so you'll know what a fair price is and feel confident about your buying decision with True Car, you can connect with a local certified dealer of your choosing so you can enjoy a quick, easy buying experience. And using the True Car website or the True Car app, you can easily find the new or used car you want. When you're ready to buy a new or a used car, visit TrueCar.com or download the True Car app to enjoy a better car buying experience. Some features are not available in all states. I had a brilliant thought this morning, which is what could be more obscene than having a commercial for Milo during the Milo podcast read out by Milo? And as everyone knows, obscene ideas are the best ones. So here goes. I'd like to take a few minutes to tell you about the new sponsor we have on the show. It's not really a sponsor. It's just me talking about what I want during my own show. Uh, That sponsor, that product is me and my online shop, Swag by Milo. Swag by Milo features a constantly updated lineup of Milo merchandise, perfect for expressing your willingness to stand up to political correctness, not to mention your devotion to me, which I treasure more than the money, to be honest. In fact, since I'm on the subject, the money doesn't come to me at all. Uh, We do spend some uh, remunerating our designers and our tech team, but the rest goes to the uh, Milo Yiannopoulos Privilege Grant, which is... Uh, a scholarship fund for uh, young white males looking to go to college who are struggling to put the money together. Lots of news coming about the Privilege Grant this year. I've been hugely busy being famous, successful, popular, and fab- fabulous. But uh, there's plenty of news coming about the Privilege Grant soon. So stand by for in a future show to hear more about that. I think actually that the Swag by Milo store deserves a full podcast to guide you through the amazing selections, but I'll just point out a few of my current favorites. Nothing will infuriate the leftist in your life more than a Feminism is Cancer t-shirt, our best-selling item available for men and women. If you have a social justice warrior in your family, your dad might love a Stop Being a Feminist hoodie, which is part of our Seven Deadly Sins collection. I think it's Stop Being a Feminist... 
stop being a cuck, stop being fat, stop being ugly, stop being a globalist, and I can't remember what the other two are, but they're all great. Um, we have accessories too, iPhone cases, and a Milo pillow, so you can take me to bed with you. I can be close to you even while you sleep. Students preparing to return to school, it's time to order your Milo posters, coffee cups, and other gear to guard you against the brainwashing you're sure to experience. Let me tell you, pulling out a bit of Milo swag in college during a, a gender studies lecture is um, the most fun you'll have all semester. One special announcement. There are no children's items available on Swag by Milo because I really hate kids. After this podcast, or during it, if you want to be one of my most favoured acolytes, you can visit swagbymilo.com and pick up the latest Milo gear, all of which goes to a good cause. And not just a good cause, but a cause that winds up the bad people more than anything else. It's the podcast with political analysis as rigorous as my daily hair care routine. Welcome back to the Milo Yiannopoulos Show on Podcast One. We're back. I'm with Eric Prince, the founder of Blackwater and now the head of a private equity firm. Uh, we spoke before the break about some of the problems with the American military and, of course, your three-point plan to defeat ISIS. I'd like to go back, if I can, a little in time and ask you about your earlier career. What motivated you to start Blackwater? Now, Blackwater is a has had a controversial reputation, largely, I th it seems to me, because you've taken the hits that ought to have been laid at the feet of the US military. You've provided training to the armed forces for special operations. You've done a lot of wonderful things, although, of course, you know, universities and the mainstream media love to crap on your legacy. But tell us about why you started Blackwater in the first place. What was it you sure. saw going wrong and what were you trying to fix? After college, I joined the Navy and I became a SEAL officer. And being in the SEAL teams was a fantastic job. I would even characterize it as the greatest job in the world. Unfortunately, in my career, my father died suddenly, and my wife got uh, sick with cancer at age 29. And so I got out of the SEAL teams to tend to those situations. My father had started a large business, and my wife certainly needed help at home. And I started Blackwater as a way to stay connected to the SEAL teams. Um, the U.S. Special Operations Units had been using small private facilities really since the 1970s for practicing and learning firearms and hand-to-hand -hand kind of skills. And so I built it. I knew nothing about defense contracting. And, you know, we just kept saying yes to our customers. And we built a big mock-up of a high school after the Columbine shootout. And we trained tens of thousands of police officers to do a better job of solving those active shooter kind of problems. And then the Navy came to us after the USS Cole was blown up in Yemen. A suicide boat driver killed 17 sailors that day and almost sank a billion-dollar vessel. And then 9-11 happens, and a lot of our same government customers needed help. At that point, we were already the largest private training center for weapons and tactics in the world. And uh, they pulled us along with them, and we did more training and security and into aviation, we went from zero to 73 aircraft in six years. We did 100,000 missions for the State Department, providing security for all the diplomats and visiting members of Congress. And, and no one under our care was ever killed or injured. And, uh, you know, the company really got roasted over the plate tectonics of left versus right. The anti-war left didn't like the or was very frustrated by the war in Iraq. And in the Vietnam War, the anti-war left went after the active duty soldiers it was a draft then yeah. and this time they went after contractors and i was the sole owner i was a former navy seal our guys carried weapons it was the largest facility of its kind so you really got very, it in the neck very easy to mislabel us like there was this private army and all the rest and that's it's just nonsense i hired professionals who were veterans uh that had served america before professionally and we gave them additional training and screening and support and sent them out to do a difficult and dangerous job for the U.S. government. So the U.S. military didn't have to because the U.S. military was busy doing other things. And here's the thing for people that hate the idea of contractors or hate the idea of that kind of work overseas. And the fact is 70% of the American people, American youth of military age, age 18 to 27, the typical enlistment ages, are not even qualified to enlist in the forces because they're overweight, they have a drug problem, they have a crime problem, well, they've had excessive tattoos. So this idea of contracting out for specialty services for the U.S. military, it's as old as history. I wrote about it in my book, Civilian Warriors. There's an entire chapter on the history of battlefield contractors. Literally, the country was started by them. So this is nothing new. 
and coming back in a much bigger way now because uh, as we just talked about the u.s military has mastered the most expensive way to wage war and the u.s military is absolutely perfect and equipped and organized to do big state-on-state combat but to fight against little cells of bad guys driving around in a toyota pickup truck in the desert you don't need a mechanized infantry brigade to do that that costs you know a billion dollars a year to field that's where the private sector can come in just like fedex or ups is far more nimble and reliable sometimes than a loaded organization like the postal service you want the speed of the free market and private innovation to help keep america adapting uh, and innovating to try to stay ahead of the terrorist insurgent threat let me ask you a personal question if i can um how much did it did this sort of demonization of Blackwater and of you personally affect you? Were you? I mean, you you seem like quite a resilient kind of guy, but at some point it's got to get to you, and you have children to think about. Did it ever start to really negatively affect your life, or have you always been able to shrug it off? You know, I started. The, I, I, I my father was very successful. I never had to work. I mean, as, <laughs> there's a there's a scene in my there's a story I tell in my book where a guy in my platoon, this is after my wife died and I was quickly leaving a week of training that we had out West in Nevada. And the guys dropped me off at this small airport and I asked them not to come in as I, I'll get my bags. Like, no, 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 Mr. P, we got you. We'll bring your bags in. And I come in the airport and there's two guys in uniforms. Hey, Eric, how are you? And it, my mom sent the private jet out to get me. And uh, I'd kept <laughs> all of that. I'd kept all of that secret. <laughs> And I was blown. I was my my cover was blown right there. And yeah, yeah. so, uh, look, I didn't start Blackwater as a capitalist, warmongering, war profiteering endeavor. I started as a way to stay connected to the SEAL teams. That I, a unit I loved, a job I loved. We ran hard and fast. I plowed every dollar the business made back into it to serve our government customer. That Lord knows they needed it. We went from one aircraft to seventy three in six years. I bought every one of those things. Yeah. So they're not cheap. <laughs> no, no. Three of them were shot down in combat. Some yeah. were other da- damaged by a rocket and artillery fire. It, so yeah, it does bother you after a while, and that's ultimately why I sold it. Because when we went from supporting and serving, and and if you read my book, we really laid everything out there, uh, including for the intelligence community, and then to be uh, vilified by the left, it just uh, yeah, it sucks, and I. Uh, I'm, I, I, I try to let all that go. I have very thick skin on my back, but whatever nonsense and, and uh, insult and injury I carry around, it pales in comparison to the guys that have lost eyes and limbs and their health or their marriages or certainly their lives. Let me move on to ask you about the subject everybody wants to talk about for the next few months. And is of course, the election, uh, Donald Trump. What have you seen from him that suggests that he's going to be a better president? Let's say, I mean, you were talking a moment ago about, you know, the veterans who have, have suffered enormously. They're being completely betrayed, it seems, by the branch of government that's supposed to be looking after them. Have you seen anything from Donald Trump that suggests that he might be, work that out better? And are you worried at all that he might, you know, his bellicose manner might translate into excessive aggressiveness overseas? Uh, I would characterize the excessive bellicosity, if that's a word. It is. Uh, that, you said. that is the word. It is, um, I'd say that's mostly showmanship. Okay. Right. Yeah. It all dials back to he's built and run a successful business and he's produced some great kids. He and, has. He's produced some very and, good and looking a children. Bad guy doesn't produce great kids. And what does the Bible say? By your uh, fruits, you will know them. Hey, yeah. he's produced some pretty squared away kids. He They're has, productive, hardworking, value adding to society people. And yeah, he's definitely not a politician. He says what's on his mind, unvarnished. And people are not used to that. And so if people want America to continue on the same negative trend that we've been on for the last couple of decades, then vote for Hillary Clinton. But if you actually want to change things, and take power away from a centralized, bloated, and elite-serving government, and vote for Donald Trump. It's a pretty clear choice. And if America doesn't 
change this trajectory that we're on. I mean, look, we've got, we're, we're twenty trillion dollars in debt, and that's a debt we pile onto our kids and generation and generation. And you know, for me, a businessman, an entrepreneur, what a horrifying fact I learned two weeks ago is that the rate of business closure now exceeds the rate of business formation. And That's people very say, shocking for a company, that is for a, a country terrible, like America. Terrible. That is a frightening statistic. Yeah. What that means is all this regulation, all the, in a lot of cases, feel good or politically connectedness rules that get passed, an average of 80,000 new pages of regulations per year pile on and pile on and pile on. And the poor guy who's got a great idea and he saved 2000 bucks from his you know, hourly wage and he's got a great idea and he's trying to start it in his garage. He can't start that business anymore yeah. because of all the regulation, all the lawyers, all the connectedness he needs. And that, that wrecks America. That wrecks the American dream. And so someone who collects as much money as Hillary Clinton does from special interests, from banks, from Wall Street, they are not going to undo those regulations. They're connected. They don't need to declutter. America will start to look more like an Egypt or a, another bloated super state with a permanent class of poor people that can never get on the bottom rung of the ladder. And that is unacceptable. That is un-American. I think plenty of listeners of this show are going to be cheering at home after that. Um, so <laughs> let me ask you two things before we wrap up. One, you mentioned Trump raising some some wonderful kids, and he certainly has. I've got a theory, by the way. I mean, they're all so beautiful, aren't they? I mean, I've got a theory. He must have the, the ugly ones, like, stashed in the basement of Trump Tower or something, because nobody has, nobody has an unbroken run of hot kids like that. I mean, there, mu <laughs> there must be an explanation. <laughs> What would be your – give me some parenting tips. You're obviously a family-oriented guy. Listeners may be able to hear the birds in the background. That's because you are you, – is it your family home? You, you have a farm. You've been out shooting with your kids. You, you're obviously a very family-oriented guy. Tell me I, some I, of your – Look, I, Milo, I try hard, but I would say my, uh, my kids have also suffered by as much as I've worked and been away. Mm. And that's the um, – you know – those are the, 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 the burdens we bear. Um, I, I was, I was taught to work hard by my father and, uh, I've tried to follow his lead in, uh, that who's too much is given much is expected. And I don't expect to meet my maker someday tan rested and ready. I, I hope to be, uh, you know, bruised, dirty, tired, and, and certainly sweaty. Well, you see, this brings me neatly on to my last question um, about, <laughs> about tan and sweaty and bruised and all sorts of other uh, aesthetics that a burgeoning Eric Prince fan club would no doubt appreciate. Did you know? <laughs> did you know? I've got to ask you. I've got to. I, I did warn you about. It, I've got to ask you. Did you know? I threw a, a gaze for Trump party during the RNC. And I had a conversation with a couple of people there, and since then, a couple of people that I, I said I was going to interview and all the rest of it. Did you know that you have quite the gay fan base? Do, do, you, do you have any idea why that might be? I have no idea what that might be. <laughs> I, uh... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's you see, you, you, you tie, oh, these words tumble out of your mouth that sound like they're directly from the casting call for a, a you know, gay softcore movie. This sort of like this is battered and bruised uh, and maybe, tanned. Maybe I don't know. And... Maybe it's maybe it's the short hair. I don't know. <laughs> no, it's very true. Well, listen, uh, if nothing else, I'm happy to have um, <laughs> introduced you to, I'm sure, something so you did, a branch of your fandom that you probably didn't know before today. <laughs> <laughs> I, would, uh, I would love to get them all a Blackwater t shirt. <laughs> well, there, uh, I'm sure, I'm sure. Well, you know, there's a certain sort of chic about it. I've been thinking with some friends that recently that we should do a sort of high fashion shoot, basically in sort of Blackwater esque gear with Trump militia on flags and, you know, and then sti stitch, no, stitch. No, no Trump militia. But, you know, <laughs> he, here's the thing uh, I, I have to give you one cool story. Do it. About training and readiness. I talked to uh, a friend of mine, a former agency officer who's uh, doing some uh, teaching for. Um, for crisis intervention for police. And he visited San Bernardino Police Department, of course, the terrible shooting that occurred there last fall. Yeah. And the guys that stopped that fight were two Fallujah veteran Marines. Okay? A female officer way. had been watching for the vehicle of the, uh, the two terrorists. She called it in rightly. The terrorists opened fire on her. 
put a very accurate pattern of bullets into the windshield of her car. Fortunately, she was smart enough to duck down below the dashboard and use the cover of the car to protect herself. But the Fallujah Marines used their training and their experience, and they were probably gun owners themselves and shot on their own time. And they basically laid an L-shaped ambush for those terrorists, and they ended it in five seconds. Incredible. God bless them. God bless them indeed. And thank you so much for joining us. It's been, it's been such a fascinating interview. It's been one of my favorite shows ever, and I know people are going to love it. So thank you so much. I'm sorry, right. I'm sorry to, have, uh, to have ended on a, a moment of enforced awkwardness, but that's kind of if where they, I live. Hey, look, if they so. want to read the rest of the story, they should read Civilian Warriors. <laughs> it's a good book, and it's an easy read. Perfect. Go and buy Mr. Prince's book, and um, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Milo. Take care. Cheers. Cheers.